the St. Thomas University, where this uh, event is uh, originating, so to speak, is located in the traditional territory of the Wallisticwick Nation, whose ancestors, along with those of the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy Nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. And these treaties did not cede or surrender any territory to the British colonizers. Um, and this is confirmed and recognized in the 1982 Canada Constitution. So we respect these territorial claims of Indigenous peoples to these lands, and we uh, look to them for guidance as we learn about and work to resolve the environmental crises that we are all concerned about. So I want to just welcome you and thank you for your interest in this lecture. My name is Janice Harvey and I'm a professor in the Environment Society program at St. Thomas in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Um, just a quick word about our university. We're a liberal arts university. We offer a wide range of programs in social sciences and humanities. And the Environment Society program combines studies in ecological literacy, perspectives, politics, and praxis, which we feel uh, make up the foundation of effective ecological citizenship. And the goal of our program is to provide students with the knowledge, critical thinking skills, and motivation to actively engage throughout their lives in bringing about an ecologically sustainable and socially just society. This event is the annual Environment Society Lecture. And I wanna say it's co-hosted by two student groups, the student union here at St. Thomas or Stu Su and the Sustainability Society. And I wanna welcome all uh, students to this lecture tonight. As Elizabeth has already said, this was originally scheduled in January as a live event and a winter storm forced us to cancel. Um, but we got a lot of feedback on the topic, it's so popular that we have arranged with Elizabeth uh, to, do this, uh, to do this lecture as a webinar. And this allows us obviously to broaden our audience significantly, and I welcome you from far and wide. And if you would, um, yes, I invite you to let us know who you are in the chat and, and where you're coming from. Um, so, um, I'm going to introduce our guest speakers shortly, but I just want to say something about the topic, which addresses two high profile concerns. First of all, the climate crisis. This is the material and risk saturated context within which all of our lives and the lives of all who come after us is now playing out. It is too late now to change this, but it does matter what happens from here on out. And depending largely on how governments respond in the next few years, that is by 2030, we will either have a fighting chance for a manageable, albeit tumultuous future, or that chance will be lost. The second topic or the second issue is one that is, is a response to climate change that is particularly fraught. Federal and provincial ministers have widely claimed that there is no route to net zero carbon emissions without more nuclear power. Yet nuclear power has its own inherent risks, a fraught history, and so far intractable, possibly insurmountable problems. At its heart, the question of nuclear power's role as a climate solution is an ethical one, not unlike that of climate change itself. So what is our responsibility to the earth and to the future? And are we really only left with a Faustian bargain? Now, let me introduce our speaker. And bear with me because I believe there may be some students who may not know of Elizabeth's uh, career. And so I want, to, uh, I want to go over that. Um, Elizabeth has worn many hats over her nearly, sorry Elizabeth, 50 years of environmental activism. It began for her with the budworm battles in Nova Scotia in the 1970s, about which she wrote her first page turner of a book, following which she studied law at Dalhousie University, fought another pesticide battle, and I would refer you to the film Herbicide Trials for that one, before moving to Ottawa in 1985 to work as counsel 
at the Public Interest uh, Advocacy Center. Now, the next year, in 1986, Elizabeth was recruited as senior policy advisor to federal environment minister Tom McMillan. In that position, she was involved in precedent setting policy developments, including the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances, the acid rain negotiations with the US government, and the development of the benchmark toxics legislation in Canada, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And she also notably helped to organize the 1988 World Meteorological Organization's landmark conference on climate change called Our Changing Atmosphere. And that was hosted by the Canadian government in Toronto in 1988. Elizabeth resigned her senior policy advisor position on principle after a backroom deal between Macmillan and, the, and Saskatchewan politicians um, that exempted the controversial Rafferty Alameda Dam from environmental impact assessment. And this was a move that the federal court later found to be illegal. Elizabeth went on to found the Sierra Club of Canada and from that vantage point was involved in every major environmental battle in Canada, including climate change and about which she continued to write books. For her activism, she's been recognized internationally as a laureate of the United Nations Environment 500 Role of Honor and nationally as an officer of the Order of Canada among many other recognitions. She has also received honorary degrees from several Canadian universities, including UMB and Mount Allison here in New Brunswick. And in 2010, Newsweek named her as one of the world's most influential women. For Elizabeth, Stephen Harper's election as prime minister posed a direct threat to climate action in Canada. And in response, Elizabeth decided to shift her activism from at the advocacy realm to electoral politics. She ran for and was elected leader of the Green Party of Canada in 2006, and five years later was elected as the first uh, Green member of Parliament and of a or of a provincial uh, legislatures um, for um, Sandwich Gulf Islands, and she continues to be the MP for Sandwich Gulf Islands. And after a brief interlude again, the leader of the Green Party of Canada. Her contribution to the work of the House of Commons has been recognized by fellow MPs by naming her Parliamentarian of the Year in 2012, Hardest Working MP in 2013, Best Orator in 2014, and Most Knowledgeable in 2020. Elizabeth has written eight books, and her memoir, Who We Are, Reflections of My Life on My Life in Canada, was listed as a bestseller by the Globe and Mail. The, the combination of experience and knowledge gained as senior policy advisor, environmental movement activist, federal party leader, and elected parliamentarian gives Elizabeth a unique perspective on many issues, and most notably, her central concern of climate change. And it is to this issue that she will address us this evening. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us and i will now turn the screen and the mic over to you well thank you janice i have to say that it's um it was very tempting to interrupt you to say oh it's it, you're overly generous and your memory is really good uh, very few people will know that actually it's it's actually more than 50 years of activism but uh, at, at uh, a spry 68 I, I know that the best of my work is yet to come, because when we look at what we're facing on the climate crisis, if my major successes are not in the future, we're in a lot of trouble. And I think all of us who are of this age, of us who've been boomers and active in the movement for decades, and I see a number of such friends uh, on the uh, on the uh, attendees list, uh, it's what um, I had the honor to know her, the founder of the German Green Party, Petra Kelly, who once famously said that we in our generation will be forced to uh, achieve the impossible. Otherwise, we in future generations will be forced to experience the unthinkable. So the topic tonight, and I, I should pause and say, acknowledging the territory where I am, I'm here on southern Vancouver Island on the traditional lands 
of the Wasanich people and in the language spoken here, Senchothan, I raise my hands to you and say Haishka, Haishka Siam. I'm very, very honored to represent an area which has had such extraordinary Indigenous wisdom and leadership over millennia. So the topic of the climate crisis and nuclear energy needs to be discussed much more. I'm afraid our entire society and including our national media has uh, swallowed some sort of make-believe pill that doesn't require that we have any evidence before jumping to the conclusion that nuclear power has any role in a decarbonized future. I will make the point tonight that not only does, is nuclear power not necessary in reaching a decarbonized economy, it is in the way. It is an obstacle to decarbonization, and I will explain why. Let's start by looking at the climate crisis. The climate crisis is an existential threat in the true meaning of the word. It threatens our existence. Until February 24th of last year, when the threat of nuclear war became real again because of the brutality and recklessness of Vladimir Putin, it was clear the climate crisis was far ahead if we have a race of, of, of the the four horsemen of of death, uh, the the four horsemen of apocalypse. One is riding the the horse in the nuclear race, and the others got the climate crisis, and they're galloping. For a while, it was we didn't have to have the same in the forefront of our mind nuclear threat. We need to pay attention to it again for multiple reasons. But I want to examine the climate crisis just to make it clear that there is probably nobody that you're going to find in Canada, or maybe, or even on this planet, more committed to finding a solution and acting on climate. Let me make it very clear by saying, if nuclear energy was any form of a solution to the climate crisis, I would think, okay, maybe we can deal with nuclear waste another time. Maybe we can ignore the other flaws of nuclear energy because we need it so much because of the climate crisis. And I think a lot of people have made the, the logical uh, failing of assuming it must be okay. And therefore, all we're talking about is given that we need to act on the climate crisis, are the downsides of nuclear energy so appalling that we must ignore the opportunities of nuclear energy? So let's look at the climate crisis first and make it very clear that no stones should be unturned in, re in avoiding the worst. This is not something that anyone likes to talk about, much less someone who's going to run for office to get reelected. Nobody wants to talk about the worst case scenario in the climate emergency because it's terrifying. And terror, fear, despair are the opposite of motivating as, as concepts or emotions. We don't want to think about it, but the threat to our survival is real. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and thanks to Janice for going through that long history, I was actually part of working within the Canadian government in the office of Tom McMillan when leading Canadian scientists like Dr. Jim Bruce brought the World Meteorological Organization and other entities together in the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is, as the name suggests, a panel put together by governments, senior scientists appointed by governments to try to take an issue as complicated as the climate issue, which we used to call climate change, and now it's climate crisis, and now it's climate emergency, but to explain it to politicians, whom David Suzuki once famously described as scientifically illiterate, the idea was this is a giant, essentially peer review process. It's slow and cumbersome in its work, but can it, Canadian leadership help put the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change together? And it has been reporting to us roughly every six to seven years on major assessment reports on where the, what the science tells us. So, I'll back up again because a lot of the media coverage of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I, I'm not going to refer to social media coverage, but you can imagine on Twitter, IPCC is, is uh, in, uh, in the bot world of trolls described in ways that bear no relation to reality. These are senior scientists appointed by governments, and their work 
is slow. Their published reports are inherently, constantly underestimate the extent of the threat. And this part's terrifying, overestimate how much time we have. That's because they're negotiating published science. So first of all, publications take a long time. They're looking at peer reviewed published science and on the order of every six years, three different working groups put together reports of thousands of pages and say, this is what we agree about. So inherently uh, underestimating how severe the threats are and overestimating how much time we have. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been advising governments in, in major assessment reports uh, for, for decades now. Back in 1992, Canada and all the countries on Earth signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Climate Change. We're still operating under that treaty. We didn't know then what it would mean uh, in terms of the language of the treaty. The language of the treaty actually says that governments of the world will work together to avoid anthropogenic climate change or human caused climate change at levels that could become, that would be, and the word used in the treaty, in the framework convention on climate change is dangerous. So we were committed to avoiding dangerous levels of climate change. We didn't know where dangerous was exactly. We're living it now, but back in 1992, we committed to avoid what exactly we're in now. It's, it's appalling but true that after all the world governments committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from human activities, primarily that's about three quarters of that is burning fossil fuels, about one quarter of that is deforestation. We've known that for decades. After committing to reducing emissions and protecting forests, we've done the opposite. And since 1992 and now, more greenhouse gases have been emitted and more fossil fuels have been burned than in the entire period of time between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and when we signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change back in Rio in 1992. We've taken us from a position of this is a future threat that could be very dangerous to what we've experienced last year in British Columbia, it gets really personal. My, my husband's youngest daughter nearly died in the heat dome. It hit 50 degrees Celsius in the backyard of the family farm where she was living at the time, 50 degrees Celsius. And about 50 kilometers away, Lytton, British Columbia burnt to the ground that same day. It burnt to the ground so fast that the new fire truck burned up in the fire station because they didn't have time to get it out. This is dangerous. The word in the convention, dangerous levels of climate change, you bet. 600, according to the BC coroner's office, to give this a source, 619 British Columbians died in those four days due to the heat dome. There were 800 and some who died, 619 determined by the BC coroner's office to have been killed by the heat dome, which was a climate crisis event. In that same season, we had thousands of wildfires. And in the fall, we had the atmospheric rivers that killed more people, that destroyed more land, that caused billions of dollars in damage. Now, I don't have to remind those of you in Atlantic Canada what killer climate events look like, because you just lived through Hurricane Fiona. And you saw, and I, I've never seen, I, I know Port Basque, Newfoundland pretty well, to see those houses basically lifted off their foundations and put into the water, carried out to sea. These are, these are events of dangerous climate crisis, but they're not the worst the climate crisis has in store for us. Again, back to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they did an assessment of the commitments that governments made not in 1992 in Rio, but in 2015 in Paris. And governments around the world committed that we would strive to hold emissions to no more than a 1.5 degree global average temperature increase 
above what the global average temperature was before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's a complicated concept. 1.5 degrees sounds like nothing, especially for those of us in Canada who live in places like many of you on this call, where it could be plus 33 degrees in the summer or minus 33 degrees in the winter. That's, that's it sounds trivial, 1.5, but 1.5 degrees is huge in global average temperature terms. The difference between the temperature on planet Earth 10,000 years ago in the last ice age and now it's a five degree global average temperature difference by degrees, five degrees. So 1.5 degrees is huge and not landing us in a safe zone. Now the Paris Agreement, back again to Paris, said we would strive to hold to 1.5 and certainly stay to as far below two degrees as possible. So what does the science tell us? Well, in Paris in 2015, the governments of the world commissioned the IPCC to do a special report outside their six to seven year assessments. Please tell us, the governments of the world, asked the scientists of the world, tell us, can we still hold to 1.5? Is it physically possible? And if we can do it, what does that trajectory look like? And what does two degrees look like? And that report came out in October 2018. And it said we can hold to 1.5 degrees, but we must reduce emissions extremely aggressively, immediately, transformative economic action is needed. And yet governments continue to increase emissions. The most recent report of the third working group of the sixth assessment came out April 4th of last year. And again, for me, it was fairly, well, terrifying isn't too big a word because again, I know this institution, the IPCC, I know they don't exaggerate. They do the opposite. They overestimate how much time we have and underestimate how dangerous it is. It's the nature of the beast taking the time and doing the peer review and negotiating it between governments. So on April 4th, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change gave us this news. In order to hold to 1.5 degrees or two, it's the first time they've ever used both temperatures in the same sentence, to hold to 1.5 degrees or two degrees Celsius, global average temperature increase, global emissions of due to burning fossil fuels, global emissions of greenhouse gases must peak, in other words, hit the highest level they've ever been, and drop rapidly before, not by, but before 2025. So we're not measuring how much time we have in decades or years, but if we're paying attention, we're measuring how much time we have in which we can take the action that's necessary to hang on to human civilization and we can measure it in months. Now, I don't want people to hear that and think, okay, then there's no hope. The message here is, guess what? We've got, we've still got time. We don't have a lot of time. We've got time to save ourselves and our kids and our grandkids, but it means we have to reduce greenhouse gases so rapidly that there's no way to hit. I mean, it's a curve that doesn't look like this. This is the problem with what the liberals say is net zero by 2050. And people in their head think, oh, we're here now. We've got till 2050. So it's a curve. It looks like this. We can do that. But it's not. It's a curve that looks like this. We have to rapidly reduce emissions so that we're not increasing anymore. We have to stop adding and start subtracting before 2025, which for Canadians means before the next federal election, if the liberal NDP deal holds, drop dramatically, and then level out to 2050. The IPCC has never said that if we can get to net zero emissions by 2050 will survive as a civilization. They've said the opposite. If we reduce emissions dramatically and by 2050 we're at net zero, we've got a chance. But they've also said we have no guarantees anymore. Current global average temperature is about either 1.1, depending on where you look, or 1.2 degrees Celsius, warmer than what it was before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And at that 1.1 degree global average temperature increase, we have heat domes, fires, 
floods. Millions of people in Pakistan displaced by floods. We have killer droughts. We have what's happened to California. And if we don't recognize that higher prices for groceries in Canada have something to do with food and crop failures around the world during due to climate change, we're just not paying attention. Now, given all that, wouldn't we want to look at nuclear energy? Wouldn't we want to look at anything? I'd like to look at a, a magical solution that comes out of nowhere without any evidence that costs a lot of money, but if it makes us feel better, maybe it's worth it. That's the only grounds on which you could look at nuclear energy and think it's a solution for anything. So I'm going to go very quickly through the nuclear piece because I realize I've spoken too long already on climate, but here's the reality. Nuclear energy has never lived up to its promises, not ever. And in Canada in particular, uh, the CANDU six, uh, CAN 600 reactor model, which was built in Point La Pro in New Brunswick, in which we have most provinces didn't go the, the nuclear route. We have Ontario, we have New Brunswick, Jean T been shut down in Quebec. The CANDU 600 is no longer being pushed even by the nuclear industry. Bruce Power, Darlington, Point La Pro, Pickering, they're not looking at building new nuclear reactors of that scale. Instead, they've gone through what I would recall, re refer to as a rebranding of the marketing variety, small modular reactors. They sound, I mean, small modular, they, it just sounds like it's some sort of really manageable, sustainable, useful way to produce electricity without carbon until you look at them. SMR, small modular reactors, don't exist around the world. They're not producing energy and electricity in other places. They don't exist. They're not in a catalog where you can order them up. How is it that New Brunswick has two proposed projects, Moltex's molten salt reactor and the ARC reactor? Where are these coming from? And this is what I really want to focus on. Why has it been adopted as though, and, and federal money is being poured in? Provincial money is being poured in. Where did we get the idea that small modular reactors were a good idea? Well, first, let's set out what would be a sensible set of criteria to measure any alternatives that we could come up with to reduce greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels. It makes sense to us, and I'm sorry, at this point, I'm going to mention I'm in the Green Party. It makes sense to us as Greens to have a set of criteria against which any new form or existing form of energy can be measured on an objective standard. So first, anything we're going to adopt right now to replace fossil fuels, what is the lowest cost option that reduces the most tons, the greater tons of greenhouse gases? What's, what is per ton reduced greenhouse gases the best option? That's one question. Second question, what react, what form of energy that we move away from fossil fuels and move to something else creates the most jobs? What we want saying that it creates long-term well-paying jobs for Canadians. Let's look at that. What form of energy will produce the most jobs replacing fossil fuels? And what comes on stream fastest? Given the scenario I just painted for you, we have to move from, we have to stop adding greenhouse gases, start subtracting them, and the curve looks like this by 2030. We have to cut at least in half by 2030 and then continue reducing to 2050. On those questions, least cost, best employer, speediest transition, nuclear energy isn't even in the race. SMRs or CANDUs, they're not even, they're not competitive at all. The clear runaway winners are things like uh, energy efficiency and conservation, technologies like heat pumps, uh, moving faster to retrofit buildings to maximize insulation. Then you get renewable energy is a much better fit than anything else in terms of cost, time it takes to bring it on board, and jobs. Nuclear isn't even competitive at all. And economically, it's a huge loser. So with the time remaining, I, I, I want to just focus on the question, how and why 
have the marketers and lobbyists so managed to bamboozle policymakers that we have people like Jonathan Wilkinson, Minister of of um, natural resources saying there's no way to get to net zero without nuclear power. It's the opposite. If you look at work done by the Henrik Bull Foundation in Germany years ago, they looked at is nuclear an option? And they found that the, the, the mindset around nuclear reactors matching the mindset around our monopolistic power utilities in every province in Canada focuses on not on demand side management, reducing demand through conservation, but in supply side management and trying to get as much power out and from monopolistic mega projects. That's the model with electrical wires over long distances. One of the really important findings of the Hendrick Bull Foundation study was that the model of concentrated monolithic power producers stands in the way of democratizing energy, of more communities having their own renewable power installations, more wind turbines, more offshore wind turbines. Alberta has huge potential in solar energy where a recent power production facility of new solar energy in Okotoks came in at under three cents a kilowatt hour. It's by far fastest, it's by far cheaper. And to that, I know that people will say, because we hear the, the, the naysayers saying, well, yeah, what about baseload power? What about when the sun doesn't shine? This has been solved by governments around the world by having interconnected grids such that, for instance, Denmark can sell its excess wind energy to Norway, and Norway can use it for pumped storage to move water up into a reservoir and then let it go when, when the wind isn't blowing in Denmark and Norway needs hydro from its own repumped storage up to higher levels when the wind isn't blowing in Denmark. These are solved issues. What we need is an interconnected utility grid such that the electricity grid itself works for Canadians like a large battery. This is energy infrastructure we need, interconnecting our electricity grids. That is not happening in Canada. Um, the Atlantic Loop has now hit a roadblock with Nova Scotia pulling out, but I'll set that aside because I want to keep going on why the, this non-starter of an experimental uh, commitment to SMRs has caught on. And that's my experience as a parliamentarian in unraveling the SNC-Lavalin scandal. You may think I've just moved to a complete non sequitur, but SNC-Lavalin is behind the push to SMRs. Because back in the Harper days, the Harper government sold what had been a boondoggle white elephant, radioactive white elephant forever, Atomic Energy of Candle Limited. We'd put billions of dollars into it. It was sold for $15 million to, you name it, guessed it, SNC-Lavalin. SNC-Lavalin is behind the SMRs. They are the primary shareholder in Canada Nuclear Laboratories, which you'll find is involved in ARC and Multex. You find them everywhere. SNC-Lavalin is behind this. And if Canadians knew that, they'd be a lot more suspicious because they'd smell a rat because anyone who's worked with SNC-Lavalin can smell the rat from miles away. Their tentacles into the government of Canada are extraordinary. That's how they managed to force Jody Wilson-Raybould out from being Minister of Justice, because she stood up for what was true, and SNC-Lavalin controlled so many civil servants, and this is something I haven't talked about much, and it's, a, it's going down a different rabbit hole altogether, but I don't think that Justin Trudeau pressured Michael Warnick, who was then Clerk of Privy Council, to pressure Jody Wilson-Raybould on his behalf, I think Michael Warnick was more than prepared to pressure Jody Wilson-Raybould on behalf of his old bus, sorry, not bus, his old boss, Kevin Lynch, who was the former clerk of the Privy Council, who was at that point chair of the board of SNC-Lavalin. These guys were hiring Supreme Court, retired Supreme Court judges to do their biddings. They are powerful as lobbyists. They're behind big hydro, they're behind SM, uh, small modular reactors, and their partners in small modular reactors bring me back to where I started nuclear war. Their partners, floor, their partners in, in uh, a number of the 
of the operations of of atomic energy of Canada these days. And I, I think I saw he was one of the attendees in this. So I really want to give a shout out to Ola Hendrickson for extremely good research that was published in the Hill Times some time ago in lining up the ways in which the uh, new refurbished, <laughs> uh, remarketed SNC-Lavalin Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, Canada Nuclear Labs, et cetera, is in deep partnerships with a company called Jacobs and a company called Floor that do work for the nuclear weapons industry. Not, not far-fetched, rather near-fetched. They are partners. They make money making nuclear weapons. This, and if you're looking at what's going on with point, La Pro's nuclear waste being repurposed for SMRs, okay, that involves reprocessing plutonium. Processing plutonium fuel is a large risk to stability of moving away from nuclear weapons. Nuclear proliferation is aided and abetted if we have a plutonium economy in reprocessed nuclear waste which the salespeople for SMRs have a lot of my colleagues in parliament thinking is great because it's like recycling. We're going to recycle nuclear waste. No, we make more nuclear waste in the process as Stanford University just proved in a recent study. And on top of that, we are playing footsie with nuclear weapons manufacturers who want plutonium to be processed and sold and a plutonium economy. So before moving to questions, I just want to give a shout out to a new campaign. You can find it at um, nuclearwastewatch.com. It's Nuclear Waste Watch's campaign to ban plutonium reprocessing. And in case anyone wants to join in, tomorrow night they're having a, uh, a session at 7 p.m. Eastern, a webinar, maybe someone can put this in the chat for me, it's called Plutonium, How Nuclear Power's Dream Fuel Became a Nightmare, uh, with a number of, of solid experts in the field. I'm not an expert. I'm a citizen activist who's mad at hell at being lied to for decade after decade after decade from the cheerleaders for the horsemen of apocalypse. I don't know about all of you, but I'm on the side of us surviving. I'm on the side of not having an apocalyptic end to the human experiment. I stand with people who will not tell our children, sorry, we're a failed species and you're stuck with the mess. We have time to save ourselves. We have the smarts to save ourselves and we have to call out the merchants of death and the liars and they're the people promoting SMRs. Thanks, and over to you, Susan, to moderate questions. I'll just say a quick thank you. Um, and as you can see, you've generated some real interest. I, I see, uh, and Susan is going to moderate the Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll get right to that. But I, I do see that people are a bit surprised at your snc level um, analysis. And um, so um, anything more that you might want to say about that uh, would probably be appreciated. Um, so before we go to the questions, um, is there anything further you want to say? Well, I have to say, I, I didn't think I cared about SNC-Lavalin. <laughs> I didn't know much about SNC-Lavalin until I was in Parliament and dealing with them managing to sneak into a Budget Implementation Act, a little line that said we could have deferred prosecution agreements. SNC-Lavalin, as people I think will know, was um, caught out, or at least its employees were, in bribing the government of Muammar Gaddafi in order to get contracts. And uh, so the government of Libya accepted um, uh, various functionaries in the government of Libya, including rel relatives of Muammar Gaddafi, accepted bribes from Canadian mega company SNC-Lavalin. That's where it started, right? That's where it started. Wow. And then they're going to go to trial. Good. Good. Corporate giants can't be above the law. Good. And when I questioned 
that one liner in the Budget Implementation Act, because I did, I, I'm, I, I read every bill and I think about every line and I went and asked questions about that one and they said, oh no, this would only be used under very specific circumstances and the director of public prosecutions would have to examine it and make sure it was in the interest of all concerned, it wouldn't be used. Now that's where the rubber hit the road for, well, that's when the trouble occurred for Jody Wilson-Raybould was that she is um, a dil diligent and ethical person and as attorney general, there's two different hats you wear as minister of justice and attorney general. In any case, the reassurance I received, this was okay in the Budget Implementation Act because the deferred prosecution agreements wouldn't happen unless it was in everyone's best interest, wouldn't be a routine get-out-of-jail-free card. Now, turns out SNC-Lavalin thought they'd bought themselves a get-out-of-jail-free card, and they could not understand it when Jody Wilson-Raybould left it to the Director of Public Prosecutions to advise her. In other words, she followed the law by the book. And SNC-Lavalin launched a major assault on her credibility, attacking within the cabinet of Justin Trudeau and attacking the position she took. And she kept warning people, as you recall. So um, it's, it, it's a longer story, and it wasn't associated with nuclear energy until I started digging into SMR reactors, trying to figure out how is it that something as experimental and unproven, like a company like Multex. I know there's someone from Multex on this call. They've never built a molten salt reactor anywhere else in the world. And so they're not exactly a proven big name. How come we're giving all this money from the New Brunswick government and the federal government? Well, SNC-Lavalin is pulling all the strings. They, they basically co-opted the cabinet of our country through very sneaky lobbying, through things like catching Bill Morneau on his way into a meeting in Davos and handing him a brief by a retired Supreme Court judge, handed to him by through the auspices of another retired Supreme Court judge, Frank Iacobucci, to say, your minister of justice doesn't know what she's doing. She's not right about the Shawcross Doctrine. Now, a lecture on the Shawcross Doctrine is not what you guys signed up for. Just to say, Jody Wilson-Raybould had the law correct in her mind. I don't think that the prime minister of this country got good legal advice. I know that sounds crazy. The only legal advice he got that was sound was from the person from whom he's supposed to receive legal advice, his minister of justice, his attorney general, the person he put in that portfolio, Jody Wilson-Raybould. And when she was pushed, then she said, okay, this is not good. I can't sit as minister for justice when I see that I have been inappropriately pressured. By the way, other sneaky lobbying, um, it was uh, Scott Bryson, who then was in the cabinet, who was in um, People's Republic of China for a trade mission. And this same thing, SNC-Lavalin's uh, retired Supreme Court judge lobbying, handing him a brief that said, you can't, you know, your minister of justice has it wrong. And the horror for me is, because I like all these people, I like everybody too much. That's just one of my failings. I have many failings, but I really, like Scotty Bryson, I love. Bill Moore, no, I thought was a perfectly lovely guy. But if they'd been handed a document that said, if it had been Erwin Kotler, minister of justice, if they'd been handed a document from a, a retired Supreme Court judge in the pay of SNC-Lavalin that said, Erwin Kotler has the law wrong on this. They would have taken that brief to Erwin Kotler. But because it was to an indigenous, about an indigenous woman lawyer, they went around whispering among themselves, Jody's got the law wrong. Horrible, horrible. Anyway, read Jody's book, uh, Indian in the, at the cabinet table, Indian in cabinet. It makes it pretty clear what happened. So she was, and in the end, SNC-Lavalin never stood trial for the bribery charges in Libya. In the end, SNC-Lavalin continues to do what SNC-Lavalin does, make money hand over fist. And they have tentacles into departments. Now, they don't need much help to get into the Department of Natural Resources because the Natural, Depart Natural Resources Department, some of us with long memories will remember it was Energy Mines and Resources. It's both the regulator and promoter 
of the can do 600s. It's a regulator and promoter of nuclear energy. So it doesn't take much for them to convince their current minister that, that all roads lead to nuclear energy if you're going to solve the climate crisis. The reality is the, the threat to increase nuclear of increasing nuclear proliferation, the threat to nuclear sanity and stability and getting the arms race under control, because right now, thanks to Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, things started getting out of control. And Vladimir Putin, of course, actually threatening the use of nuclear weapons. And yes, Slava Ukraini, we have to protect Ukraine. We have to make sure nuclear weapons aren't on the table. But Canada, again, is playing a role in promoting nuclear proliferation by playing with SMRs and with the partners that SNC-Lavalin has around the world that are involved in nuclear weapons manufacture. We have to stop being naive and we have to really ask who thought SMRs are a good idea Please explain. Please put them on trial. Let's have some hearings. The Parliament of Canada has never examined them. And as I said, a lot of my friends in Parliament uh, actually swallow this and think that this is recycling nuclear waste when you take plutonium from the spent fuel of a Canada 600 reactor and repurpose it for an SMR. This is deeply dangerous stuff and does nothing to address the climate crisis. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Susan, Elizabeth. Thank you for uh, and just for elaborating on that. And Susan's going to um, manage the Q and A. Thank you, Janice, and thank you, Elizabeth. I think this was the first time I've seen in a discussion about nuclear such a fulsome discussion about the role that SNC Lavalin is playing. So I'm sure all of us appreciate it. I'm going to go through the questions in order, but I'm going to start with a question by Sarah Caldwell, who actually, it, her question was knocked back and forth, and part of that was by accident. And this is something that we hear a lot of people say about Germany. And mm -hmm. the, the actual thinking is, well, hey, Germany had to uh, restart its nuclear plants, is what we hear, um, you know, because of the current crisis that they're in. And so doesn't this mean that we're all going to need to that we're all going to need nuclear so if you could say anything about what's happening in germany that would be appreciated it's really hard what's happening uh, gosh i mean these are uh, these are the two german green party co-leaders who find themselves in the situation there and robert habeck is now minister for energy and uh annalena borbach is minister for foreign affairs they're they're colleagues in the I'm co-chair of something called the Global Greens Parliamentarians Association. And so we're, and so I, I only really know Annalena, but Robert Habeck to suddenly find himself, oh, okay, so we're decarbonizing in Germany. We actually have to use more coal this year. We're decarbonizing in Germany and we're going off nuclear energy. So uh, what's happened is not, they're not building any new nukes. They're not going for SMRs. They've agreed to, for a very short period of time to keep existing reactors operating longer to help Ukraine in what has been uh, a threat that Putin has made very explicit to cut off their energy supplies and have them freeze. Um, this is uh, so Germany is not rethinking going nuclear, but they did decide as a cabinet, and I can't imagine what my German green colleagues had to go through to extend the life of existing reactors. And I don't know that anyone in the Canadian climate movement is calling for shutting down reactors that are currently operating in Ontario. What we're calling for is, and of course, this is what happened with Point Lepro, wasn't that long ago, I think a lot of you in New Brunswick will remember that the New Brunswick Electrical, um, uh, com the Public Utilities Commission recommended against spending money on retubing Lepro because it would be more expensive than what it was worth. But the New Brunswick government overrode the Public Utilities Commission and ordered this to take place. It's gone over budget, et cetera. But nuclear reactors in terms of the, the what's happening in Europe and what's happening in the horrors of, of uh, Putin's attack on Ukraine, uh, there has been a significant um, jolt to the immediacy of power sources. But Ukraine, Germany, the European Union remain committed to 
reducing greenhouse gases rapidly. They're all much farther ahead than we are. And um, in terms of the European Union collectively is at about 34% below 1990 levels in terms of its CO2 emissions. And Canada, right up till COVID, we were 20% above 1990 levels. So we are far off course compared to industrialized country allies within the G7. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, great. Okay, the next question is from Carolyn Hebert. And she's wondering about why, when we're talking about building new re renewables, are they being established in large complexes of wind turbines and solar arrays instead of flat roofs, localized power, et cetera? That's the first part of the question. And then the other part is about what it's going to take to uh, get Ontario off of nuclear. But the whole idea of localized power versus yeah. central. Every, there's a lot of, mom. Well, there are variations across the country for sure in terms of the monopolistic power utilities in each province, right? So BC Hydro only likes to build big dams. Um, New Brunswick and, and New Brunswick likes to have, uh, wants to go nuclear. There are differences. Hydro Quebec wants big dams. Nova Scotia Power has Amera now is still burning coal mostly for its electricity. The one thing all of these power utilities have in common is they want to remain monopolistic and they want to focus on the old model that they supply the power. This is a revolution in the way we conceive of energy producers. None of these big monopolistic utilities want independent power producers. None of them want like what what happened in, and it's it's a historical anomaly that uh, Nelson BC was able to hang on to its independent utility, but they have solar gardens, so small installations of solar arrays that feed in to producing power. Um, Chester, Nova Scotia has a windmill, wind, one wind turbine that last I looked was producing for the town of Chester about a million dollars a year in revenues to the municipalities. But for, um, for to and briefly, the BC government got BC Hydro to agree that installations of renewable energy on First Nations lands would be uh, part of uh, the, you know, with the right to sell into the grid. And then the New Brunswick, not Brunswick, sorry, the BC NDP put forward a law to end that. And there was a big pushback. We, sh we do right now, by the way, have more installed renewables happening on indigenous lands than anywhere else. But the mindset and the model of large concentrated mega projects persists when the technology has moved past the mindset. So we really do have to attack the, um, the mental model of the big plant and the long electricity lines. We have to start thinking about, talking about democratizing energy, democratizing electricity, small hamlets, big towns, individual homes, being able to generate the electricity they need while using the grid for backup. So you sell into the grid, you pull out of the grid, and that's when the whole argument of baseline power and intermediate becomes another anachronism of another era with a different mindset around how is, how is energy produced, how is it used, who sells it. And this is another thing that this is what the power producers really don't want is when the marginal cost of electricity goes to zero. That blows their whole model, right? If the marginal cost of electricity, if, if you have fully installed solar, wind, and low flow hydro, geothermal, and you don't buy fuel anymore, to produce electricity. It's just wind, sun, wave, ground. Once that happens and we electrify more of our economy, the marginal cost of electricity goes to zero. Lots of good news for real 
people and mayors and First Nations. Really bad news for electrical power producers whose profit model is blown to smithereens by zero marginal cost electricity. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the next question is from Ingrid. I just want to clarify something. She said the Saskatchewan party announced that it plans to build a couple of SMRs. Actually, they're not going to be making that decision until 2029, they've said. However, they have identified two places, the banks of Diefenbaker Lake, where Saskatoon gets its drinking water from, and also Estevan, which is the second site. And what she's asking, would Elizabeth come to Saskatchewan to help educate the people of Saskatchewan and Estevan? So I guess that's a question if you have anything to say to the people of Saskatchewan. Ingrid, tell me when and where on my way. I, I, I have a, it is on my agenda to get to Saskatchewan soon, but to make it a, a set of um, talks against uh, SMRs and to explain why nuclear technology has no place in a decarbonized future, I'd be thrilled to get there. Somebody's sending you a heart. Maybe that's Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> the next question is from Rani, and he's saying, could you talk about the micronuclear plants? I'm not sure if he's talking about SMRs or the little micro ones that, are, that they're talking about, like they're building up, up in Chalk River, for example. And do you have anything to say about those? Yeah, well, those again, I mean, every, you look at who the corporate ownership is, look who's promoting it, know that they have a profit model, and ask yourself, is that really, you know, the Chalk River, of course, remains... Uh, part of the only part of a lot of what Atomic Energy of Canada Limited that got sold off to SNC Lavalin were the parts that um, that SNC Lavalin thought it could make money dealing with, and it left a lot of the Chalk River nuclear waste behind. But there are um, there are efforts to to build um, nuclear fuel fabrication plants and more research facilities at Chalk River to develop what they're calling a fuel pin prototype fabrication line for arc technology and these you know mini reactors they'll they'll they've also announced recently um, more research money to go with all the various ways that people are looking at nuclear so I, I, you know it's I, again it's um, the amount of time it takes to get approval to build one of these things means that they're outside the timeline of usefulness, number one, and they won't be, uh, they, they will never be cost competitive with other forms of electricity generation from renewable energy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm just going to go to a question from Mike Nickerson, who has a slogan he's put out a few places, more fun, less stuff. And she, he's asking about, along with the physical adaptation that needs to happen, what about efforts to shift our materialist culture? How important is that? Oh, it's so nice to know that Mike is on this call. Mike has been on the, you know, one of the forward thinkers for a really long time and writing. I mean, gosh, I'm, Mike, forgive me that I'm gapping on the name of your book, um, Seventh Generation. I mean, I've been promoting Mike's books for a long time. Um, yeah, less stuff. Anybody who wants to look at the really solid work in this area, it, look to um, Professor William Reese at UBC. Uh, William Bill Reese has been pointing out it's one thing to talk about going off fossil fuels, but that's not enough. If we keep up our current patterns of consumption, we'll consume the living earth and have nothing left. So we do need to think about uh, a more fun, less stuff, more equity less stuff. There's a lot of um, both threats to our survival in terms of the climate crisis, but all in, in fossil fuel use. But if we insist that we can have, you know, have our cake and eat it too, we can keep having conspicuous consumption that defines our, our 21st century economy and the lifestyles of those of us in the industrialized world. It's not sustainable it's not sustainable in terms of, of food and, and, and meat production. It's not sustainable in terms of stuff. So it's been an, it's been a long time since, you know, we talked about um, living more simply so others can simply live, but those are, those are urgently to be examined. And the last place, by the way, people might want to look as in most recent 
really solid and impressive decisions, but they're not binding, came out of COP15, the 15th Conference of the Parties, the Biodiversity Convention. The Biodiversity Convention was also signed in Rio in June 92, and it has been meeting on a pattern of once every two years, which is why um, the last climate negotiation was COP27, but the last biodiversity convention was COP15. But really very, very um, impressive commitments, slashing food waste, cutting pesticide use, living in harmony with Mother Earth. This came into UN documents. It's the Kunming Montreal uh, decision, Kunming Montreal framework on global biodiversity. And you'll find a lot of the concepts of reducing consumption globally, reducing stuff is, is a clear imperative of survival. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we've got so many more questions. And um, I'm going to ask if maybe we could go to shorter answers. You're fantastic. I'll try. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. don't tell guys. They're great answers. I we'd just like to get through as many as we can. Okay, this other this next one from Diane Rose. If we're so serious about cutting carbon emissions, why are we buying 88 fighter jets when one hour of jet fuel is the same as the emissions of taking one car off the road for seven years? The F-35s have nothing to do with defense and everything to do with contracts falling off the table from the U.S. Um, uh, military industrial complex to subcontractors in Canada. That, that's the whole model for why we're buying F-35s. Uh, they do not perform anything useful in Canadian defense. They're part of a global war machine, and we should have nothing to do with it. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Bill Knoll, who's doing great work out there uh, against the potential DGR in his uh, community. The question is, do you have a number of the new jobs that renewable energy sources will create over the next decade, including wind, solar, storage? Can you say anything about jobs? Yeah, the biggest job creator is in retrofitting buildings. We have to retrofit all our buildings. So think about the skilled trades, the electricians, the plumbers, carpenters. We need, we need more workers than we have to attack the sources of greenhouse gases that come from built infrastructure that's typically overhauled every 30 to 45 years. So that's the biggest job creator is there. Installing renewable energy, particularly solar panels, is done quickly and easily, and then it's very routine maintenance to make sure they're operating. A lot of jobs will be created by reclaiming uh, the abandoned mines, we have about 100,000 abandoned mines in Alberta. These are oil wells. I shouldn't say abandoned mine, abandoned oil wells. About 100,000 abandoned wells in Alberta, uh, tens of thousands more in Saskatchewan, tens of thousands more in northern BC. But those abandoned oil wells, uh, about 10% of them have enough heat at depth to produce geothermal. So that's a job creator that employs some of the same folks who drilled the wells in the first place. But there's more jobs than we have people. So we don't. Uh, so that's why I don't have the figure in my head. But certainly it's, it's tens of thousands of people immediately needed nonstop for retrofitting our buildings. Thank you, Elizabeth. OK, the next question from Pablo Costa. Uh, wondering how you see the current global geopolitical situation affecting international efforts to improve renewable um, resources, sharing data, tackling climate change? Well, I mean, obviously the, the, the war on Ukraine is a disaster for our climate work for the moment. It's, it's a humanitarian disaster and be really, really clear, obviously Putin attacked Ukraine. No matter what else was going on before then, we know that Putin has attacked Ukraine and has been committing war crimes and breaking international law. In that context, I think it's really impressive how President Zelensky has continued to call for climate action, continued to say, yeah, we're going to go off Russian oil, we're going to go off all oil. So there's there's not, there shouldn't be seen to be any competition between uh, supporting Ukraine against Russia and saying we have to go off all fossil fuels as quickly as possible. In fact, the head of the Ukrainian delegation to the IPCC 
uh, back when the war first started a year ago, said, you know, the Svetlana Kakaska said, you know, if it, the the war on Ukraine and the climate crisis have the same root cause, our dependency on fossil fuels. So I don't think we take our eye off the ball. We have to make sure that we're going off fossil fuels as quickly as possible and doing everything possible. Um, we've had some misunderstanding about Green Party position in media lately. I'll just add that we've, we, we're supporting what our government's doing in sending defensive weapons to Ukraine, but we also wonder why we're not doing more to try to force Russia to the to the to any kind of negotiating table. I'm not naive about Putin. We don't want to. We we recognize Putin's actions are monstrous, but if if we can get the sanctions to really bite and the Russian economy to really suffer, it's important that we also lay this out. Uh, at, you know, as a constant question, what is the pathway? to diplomacy. We don't want to take anything off the table. So while we're sending weapons to Ukraine, we are also asking where is the pressure? Where are the leverage points that could get Russia to agree to a ceasefire? Not that we're naive about the chances of that occurring, but that it's critical that we keep asking the question. Great. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Aaron Polka. Uh, doesn't recycling, reprocessing spent fuel reduce the total volume of plutonium available for misuse? It doesn't because it keeps making more as it uses it, right? So I was looking for this article. There was a very good article not long ago. I think I put it to the side. Oh, yeah. Um, highly radioactive nuclear waste is generated. You, you'll generate more radioactive waste than conventional nuclear power plants. So it's it's taking it from one form of, it's hardly, you know, storage uh, and, and putting it into a reactor, small modular reactors, which will create more nuclear waste. So it doesn't reduce the overall volume. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, okay, this question is, I wanna make sure I get it right here. Uh, okay, elaborating on the ousting of Jody Wilson-Raybould. What's she doing now? How is she doing? She's awesome. Uh, she's she's writing more books. She's touring. With, she's. Uh, I mean, I really miss her in Parliament. I wish she hadn't decided not to run again because she was a, a really powerful voice. But I'm sure she'll return in ways that that you won't have to ask where she is. Okay. Thanks. The next one, these questions are jumping all around here. Uh, from Quintina, Quintina Northrup. Are you seeing the discussion about the urgent need to begin the process of moving people out of the oil, gas, coal, and nuclear energy sectors and into clean energy sectors for employment? Uh, this is not really a question. I guess it's a question is, do you know about this? <laughs> mm. Okay, I'm just posting. I'm wondering if I can post for everyone. There we go. I'm just posting that article I referenced from Stanford University. Um, so uh, there's there's a huge movement of people because they also see the handwriting on the wall. The people in the fossil fuel sector are not um, unrealistic, and they know that they are in a sunset industry, and they're interested in moving away from it. So there's some very, it's, I'm not speaking of absolutely every person, but there's a significant movement. There's group, the one group I recommend you look up online is called Iron and Earth, and it's former workers from the oil sands and former workers from oil rigs offshore Newfoundland Labrador who have put their energies into let's move to installing renewable energy. Let's work in a field that's growing. And if you, and if you look at where the investment dollars are going, the investment dollars are very much moving in the direction of renewable energy. And so when, you, and these are people, of course, who are interested in making more money on what they invest. They're not um, um, altruistic. And there's a significant shift in where investor dollars are going. Okay, great. Um, okay, Paul Gallagher or Gallagher uh, just listed seven questions. <laughs> I'm going to pick one. Um, all right. Okay, this is about: Is it true that some nuclear waste and, and newly dangerous uh, created uh, to toxic isotopes in during the fission process last for hundreds of thousands of years? How long does this re radioactive material last? 
About a quarter of a million years. I mean, the high level nuclear waste lasts about it's a quarter million years in terms of the half lives and how long it takes for it to deteriorate. That's why um, high level nuclear waste is kept underwater. It would otherwise continue to um, to consume itself through heat. Um, and I, I've had the view for some time, and I don't know if others agree with me who've worked on the nuclear waste issue, that one reason we haven't, quote unquote, solved the nuclear waste issue is that the industry itself wants to keep high level nuclear waste in retrievable settings, such as in the swimming pool type settings next to nuclear reactors, because if they were to ever glassify it, put it deep underground in an irretrievable space, it might not be 100% secure against leaks in 100,000 years from now or so, some such, but it would be irretrievable to the current nuclear industry that uh, whether breeder reactors or small modular reactors or whatever else they might be developing, they want to have that nuclear waste accessible to them. That's my personal belief. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, the next question from David Lewis, uh, talking about the, the limits to growth, that sort of seminal publication that came out in 1972, and all the predictions that their different models uh, suggested might happen, which some of them, you know, look like they have actually come to fruition. Um, and I guess the question is about isn't producing more nuclear power and nuclear waste and stockpiles of lethal radiation, etc., this is really jumping around, uh, that we have to uh, maintain in perpetuity, isn't this sealing the fate of life on earth as we know it? Well, it certainly isn't, isn't um, helpful for life on earth to be creating long-lived nuclear waste. Nuclear isotopes are um, toxic, radioactive, long-lived, highly dangerous. Uh, so it's better if we stop using nuclear energy in any form and, and and we should be by the way i've talked about nuclear weapons i haven't mentioned how little canada has done to join and support we've done nothing we haven't even signed on uh to be um, participating in treaties to abolish nuclear weapons we haven't even attended as an observer the nuclear uh the treaty to prohibit nuclear i'm just saying that canada has done very very little on the uh, support, well, nothing. We've done, we have done nothing that the U.S. doesn't want us to do, which is to say we've done nothing to support the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. And we didn't even send, as other allies of ours that are in NATO that also uh, support the U.S. and haven't signed on to the nuclear treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, but other countries like Norway sent uh, a delegation to observe the meeting that happened in June of last year in Vienna, the first meeting of the parties on the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Canada has been extremely, um, well, useless. Just we've been absolutely on the sidelines. And the arguments we use for why we're doing it are saying, well, we don't have nuclear weapons. We don't, we're not nuclear weapons manufacturers or or holders, so we have no role in this. But it was Canada that led the landmines treaty. We didn't have any, we weren't manufacturing landmines. We didn't use landmines, but we were in the forefront, obviously. That's why it's called the Ottawa process to ban landmines, it won a Nobel Peace Prize. But we are completely hypocritical in standing back and saying we can't do anything about nuclear non proliferation. And we are pit playing footsie with the nuclear industry every time we get close to, which we're doing now, planning for reprocessing plutonium from uh, high-level nuclear waste sites next to reactors. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Evelyn Gigantes wrote a question. It sort of disappeared off my screen, but I want to bring it back here. Um, SNC Lavalin, and I, I, I personally saw the ad that they put in the Hill Times before Christmas, is talking about the fact that we need to build 20 more can do reactors, big ones. Mm -hmm. And just wondering if you have any comments on the thought that we need a massive uh, build out across Canada of can do reactors. Well, it's appalling, but bear in mind, let's not forget we're dealing with criminals here. They're called SNC Lavalin. They bribe people in foreign countries. If they want to sue me for saying what it is they do, fill your boots. But SNC-Lavalin is a powerful for-profit corporation that Stephen Harper let buy 
the assets that were Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, on which Canadians had spent billions of dollars. They got it for a song, $15 million, and now they're well positioned because they they own the technology. They own the AECL, which we used to think of as the Crown Corporation AECL, is a, essentially a subsidiary, except for a few small bits, of SNC Lavalin. So I'm not a bit surprised they're running ads in the Hill Times. I'm not a bit surprised they're talking about building new nuclear reactors. They don't care how long it takes to build them, and they don't care if they work, and they don't care if the climate crisis is solved. They'll make money. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, there's another question about SNC from John Bennett. Do you think that SNC-Lavalin is be behind the SMRs not being subject to an environmental impact, environmental assessment, impact assessment? Of course, but let's just be clear. Stephen Harper, in spring of 2012, in something called Bill C-38, the Omnibus Budget Bill, uh, uh, repealed Canada's environmental assessment law and replaced it with something that we now have experienced with uh, energy projects being reviewed by then the National Energy Board and then the Canadian Energy Regulator. And then when the Liberals came in, it's a longer story than I can get to, except to say that the Liberals repaired what Harper did to the Fisheries Act, and they pretty much 100%, close to like say 85% repaired what Harper did to the Navigable Waters Protection Act. But they left in place what Harper did to the environmental assessment legislation, Bill C-69, which Jason Kenney lambasted as the Anti-Pipeline Act might as well have been the pro-pipeline act because it's a discretionary piece of legislation that has let most like by like 90 percent of projects that used to have to go through an environmental assessment because federal land federal money or federal jurisdiction was involved they're all off the hook because the whole piece of legislation that was brought in and i think it's such a shame that so many environmental groups thought, well, that must be really good legislation if Jason Kenney hates it. I'm afraid that's not really a good enough test of if it's good legislation. It, uh, it's appalling. It's some of the worst environmental assessment legislation of any country on the planet. And they didn't have to work to get nuclear plants exempted. Nothing is covered, right? It's, it's virtually all discretionary. So. I'm, I'm afraid to say it, we it's one of it's one of the Trudeau Liberals' biggest failures, and I believe it's because the Environmental Assessment Agency itself, which got called the Environmental the um, Impact Assessment Agency, I went in to talk to them the minute that the Liberals took over after Harper. I said, "Okay, when are you going to repeal Bill Bill C-38 that wrecked the environmental assessment legislation?" And one of the senior people in the bureaucracy said, "Oh, well, you know." We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It wasn't all bad what Harper did. So the the eight and I, this is another insight again about how much is their deep state infiltration of our civil service by folks that want pipelines to be built and don't want nuclear reactors to be assessed. I'd say a lot. I'd say they're in charge. And that's not about politics. That's deep in the civil service and the cultural direction of a couple of departments. But it's it's a big problem. I mean, Health Canada has way too much influence of the pharmaceutical industry, just as Natural Resources Canada has too much influence by the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the nuclear industry. It, it's going to be a really big piece of work for whatever government decides to actually say we want evidence-based decision-making and it's not enough to say politics didn't interfere. That's what the liberals have done. Then we're not interfering with our politics. Oh, okay. But where's the evidence? And and okay. I'm afraid the civil service no longer has the core science capacity to do neutral evidence making. You have decision-based evidence making still under the liberals, just as we had decision-based evidence making under the conservatives. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to try and squeeze two more questions as one question, and this will be the last one before I turn it back to Janice. This is about decommissioning. So the first piece is from Carl, 
who's saying, do we have enough in the reserve fund to actually pay for the decon decommissioning of, of the existing reactors. And the second question it references a recent article by Amory Lovins, who says that really the future of nuclear, the nuclear industry should be the business of global decommissioning. So do you have anything to say about decommissioning reactors and the opportunities that exist on a business side? Well, I know I've seen some recent studies from real life costs of decommissioning, and they're way more than people had put aside for it. So we know there's not enough in reserves for decommissioning. Absolutely right. It's just, as I said, for, for the fossil fuel industry, focus on, de uh, on, on repairing and restoring the lands of the tailings ponds of the oil sands. Look at repairing the 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 deep oil wells that have been abandoned the nuclear industry has more than enough work decommissioning and putting it in something that it approximates uh, or as, as close to as possible to safe storage it's more than enough work um forever i i'll close with this because i always remember with um fred nelman's great quote from what if janice remembers fred nelman i think said this in Maybe John Bennett remembers. Maybe Evelyn Gigante's remember. A lot of people on this call who have good memories. But I think Fred Nelman may have said this in 1980 that nuclear technology, that nuclear energy is a future technology whose time has passed. That's a great one. I actually haven't heard one that one. That's great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth and everybody. We didn't have time to get your all, all your questions, but you'll just have to come to our next webinars and uh, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to do that then. I'm gonna turn it over to Janice Harvey now for closing. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you so, so much for taking this time with us. You have uh, demonstrated <laughs> Uh, an incredible depth of knowledge and the range of questions that you got and, and you were able to handle is really, you know, quite mind boggling. Appreciate it so, so much as does everybody I'm sure who was on tonight. Um, and, but what it's also demonstrated is how deep this topic is and how much more there is to say about what our pathway to um, a decarbonization actually is. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you again in uh, New Brunswick, I think, in a month or so. Or two weeks. It's easy to remember the Green Party Fredericton EDA is on St. Patrick's Day. So it's a good day to be green and I'll see you then. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks everybody for uh, being part of this. Elizabeth uh, is moving on to, I don't know, meeting number four or five. Uh, when she hangs up uh, here. And uh, so um, I'm sure you'll um, all appreciate uh, that um, Elizabeth's time is limited, but very generous to me. Well, Janice, thank you for your time and, and um, all your work for so long. I'm very, very grateful. And it's lovely to see so many old friends virtually. And thank you for, thank you, Susan, for letting me rant a tiny bit on some of those answers. I know I should keep my answers shorter, but it's, um, it's my husband says Elizabeth starts an answer and several weeks later she finishes. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's great to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you too. And thanks to Bernine Lloyd and Susan O'Donnell for the technical support and the Q&A support. And with that, um, I will just say good night uh, to everybody. Thanks again for being part of this. <laughs>